Well, friends, let's, let's have our hearts and our minds aligned, turning toward God. I'm going to take just a moment while the music's playing just to, to not say anything, to be in silent prayer to the Lord. <clears throat> Lord, we have thanksgiving that, that should pour forth in praise. Your hand has been with us. Lord, you have sustained us and directed us, given us salvation of our souls, called us to, to the, the heart of your Son. Lord, we thank you for all the answered prayers, for the, the things that we know that your hand has been in. We thank you for Cindy McComb, her, her foot to be healing. We thank you that we saw Patty Housel in the first service and, and from, from her foot injury. Lord, we thank you for, for guiding us through our days and, and providing for us. Lord, we ask that, that you hear the, the compassion in our hearts and that there would be a return from you of mercy and help. For, for Sally Warner for a surgery this week, for Jerry and Heather Bothers as Jerry recovers from a stroke. Lord, we ask for those that, that we can name. We know they, have, they, they could be treating cancer. They could be struggling with dementia, with, with uh, the, ons the, the progress of aging, the taking away cognitive ability. Lord, we pray for, for those that are in the nursing homes and, and whose lives are now kind of, kind of limited to one space and one place to be. Lord, we pray for everywhere there is sickness for healing. Lord, we pray for those that this, this week where they'll get People will get news from a doctor. People have that test that, Lord, your hand be so evident in what is going on that we take comfort and strength. Lord, we pray for this community. Lord, we, we want the churches in this community to have, have every help from you. Uphold, strengthen, guide, and just set on fire the pastors, those that are helping to lead. Lord, to call people to, to your throne this Easter that comes. Lord, that people look and say, I I." Need to, need to hear what the solution to death is. Lord, we pray for a world and, and just ask that you bring peace to so many places. And our, our hearts are full of the needless destruction and loss of life in the Ukraine. And ask, Lord, that you come alongside, and bring peace to that place. Lord, Lord, protect, help the vulnerable, uphold the cause of right. Lord, that you would, you would be with each leader in this world. That, that you would, you would cause, cause them to, to know your will and to do it, set your hands on their hearts to guide them in the way you would have them to go. Lord, we ask for believers who are, who are in countries where the life of the believer has been made very difficult for persecution and death and imprisonment. And Lord, that, that, these, that know these burdens would have help from you. Lord, we pray for those who serve our nation and its military and just ask that you be a protection to them. Help them in times of long deployments to, to remain close to their families. And when they are sent forth on missions, let, let the right things, good things be done. Uphold and help them to protect vulnerable people. Lord, we pray for our unspoken requests. Lord, for what is deep upon our heart. Lord, we pray for, for, for us when, when we come before you, not knowing how even you can solve. Lord, make a way. And Lord, just be with your church. Help us to follow up the praises of Palm Sunday with the own praise of our heart. And we give you this, Lord, and offer it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Now, the scripture that I want to share with you is out of, uh, out of Hebrews chapter 2, and it's beginning at verse 5, and down through verse 11, where it says, For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, Psalm number 8 actually, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him? You made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. 
Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. At present, we do not see everything in subjection to him, but we see him, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. Lord, call, call us, your family, those whom you have named as brothers and sisters, near to your heart and your wisdom today. Amen. Now, I'm probably on my what? 61st or 2nd Palm Sunday, you know, and it's, it's, they're so fun. Because as the saying goes, who doesn't love a parade, right? Everybody loves a parade. Now, now, so the, the Palm Sunday scene in, in the Gospels is one of a parade. They, they gather together, they open up the gates, they, they're waving their palm branches, they're spreading their cloaks on the road, and the focus of attention is on, on the procession that is going by. It's a special time. They didn't, like, every time somebody rode through the gates on a donkey, they didn't make such a fuss. But, you know, it was a parade. It was a for Jesus coming in. And, you know, it is important to note that, that of all the things that are shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David, Hosanna in the, in the highest, blessed be the coming kingdom of our, of, our, of our God. And in Luke he says, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. These words are being shouted by the crowd, and the crowd has a specific idea behind this parade. They are proclaiming Jesus to be king. You know, if you read the Old Testament, you didn't get the, a parade in Jerusalem, seemingly, unless you were riding in his king. We have Solomon, rides, go, in, is paraded through Jerusalem on the making of him as king. Joash, same way. We had pretenders who tried to get up a parade and get themselves made king. That was, that was you know, that's Absalom. And the words in, in the prophet Zechariah, he says, you know, you're, you are to look for this. Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king comes to you humble and riding on a donkey. These people in Jerusalem say, we found our king. They're certain of that, and they're, they're proclaiming that. I've always been on the side of the Palm Sunday crowds. I know that we can get to preaching on Good Friday or Easter and say, where were all those people who cheered Jesus? Where are they? they you know, I don't know where they are, and then let's let them sort that out where they were. But do you understand, this crowd specifically is saying, here we have the King of Israel. Now, it's interesting that the Romans probably did not, did not you know, Look at it that way. And, it is, and it's always been fascinating in the Gospels that, that uh, the Romans don't respond on Palm Sunday. You know, they have a lot to do, nailing Jesus to the cross and, and uh, pr trying him before Pilate and, and, and everything, but they don't respond on Palm Sunday. The, the high priests do. They know that this is hot stuff to declare somebody king because it's already been sorted out between Caesar and the governor and King Herod and everybody who's in charge. The Romans don't respond. In essence, the Romans gave a lot of parades. You know, it's where we get the tradition that if you have done something pretty cool, we'll give you a parade, right? We'll do that, you know, that that, you know, that could, because of the Roman general went off and he, and he won a great victory with his legionnaires and he had all kinds of prizes of battle and captives and whatnot. He went back to the city and they opened the doors and everybody had a huge parade. And so you had a lot of these. In other words, if you did, you know, you know how it is. If, if somebody says, hey, I did this, it was pretty cool. If you were in a in that if you're, if you're going to be snarky, you'd say, what, you want a parade, you know, for it? That's how we do it. We get that tradition from that. If you get so, do something, you know, if amazing, you might get a parade. I've even had a parade. It's a little known fact. A few years back, the, the city, of, the village of Minerva, 
for some unknown reason, a, a, a lapse in judgment proclaimed me person of the year. <laughs> really funny, you know, yeah, it's funny. Yeah, it was, well, you know, my family really enjoyed the whole concept. You know, that was pretty cool. I know, because they're, they're fans. And, uh, and part of being person of the year is you're going to be grand marshal, you're going to ride in the upcoming parade. And now you know how a good American deals with that. We say, seriously, you're going to make, I'm going to be made a fool out of in front of all kinds of people because, you know, nobody really wants that much attention. Nobody really wants, what do you, you know, yeah, you have to practice your princess wave and everything, you know. And, you know, so it was part of the deal to get named person of the year is you're going to ride in the parade. And, and we do have that. We, we fear to, to have that idea that people would look at us and say, why does he think he's so special or, you know, that. And, um, and true to form, you know, when we got to the parade day, it was a terrible, wet, cold day. Despite it, you know, just being nearly summer, it was a terrible, wet, and cold day. And you did ride in the car pretty much with the windows up. You could stick your little hand out and wave like that, and there was really nobody there. In fact, when Cindy and I talked about it, we, we both of us barely remember, you know, the parade. Because parades are like that. They're here, they pass, they're gone. But it is a Roman tradition that if somebody does something great, they get a parade. It's not a tradition that give him a parade, he's king. Nobody said that. That's a Jerusalem tradition. The other, you, my, my kind of letdown experience in being, having a parade of which I was one central figure uh, helped me to understand there's, there's another, if true, tales be true, that are told about Roman traditions, is that if you were that general, you're riding into town, you had, you had all the legionnaires marching in front of you, and all the crowds cheering you, it was a rule that they had to get one slave to walk behind you and now and then say, remember you're going to die. You, you're, you're riding in triumph. Everybody is cheering your great ability that you are just the chiefest toast of ever, man. And there's supposed to be a slave walking behind you said, psst, psst, remember you're going to die. I'm kind of glad that the Minerva people, you know, didn't get me one of those, you know, to do that. You know, that would be really kind of a downer. So the, there is a a mixed view of Jesus coming in on Palm Sunday. The, the crowds feel they have crowned a man king with their praises. And the Romans say there is a man who is going to die. They are both partly right. They are both partly right. The Jews have, as far as you can get, in, a, in how you were to set somebody aside as king, it, to have him paraded into Jerusalem on that donkey in response to the words of the prophets with all the people saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. You have made a man into a king. But he is more than just a man who they are making king. The Romans are right to say that this man must remember and he certainly does remember that he will die. But this is a man who, after he has been properly, legally, and by all accounts, you know, certainly been put to a natural death, will then walk right out of the tomb. He is more than both of those groups think that he is. You see, the Hebrews 2 makes a phenomenal claim. Makes it at least three times in the, as just as it gets going. You know, it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, which means it has been to Jesus that the world to, go, to come is subjected. And verse 8, putting everything in subjection under his feet, and then now in putting everything in subjection to him. And, they, and the writer of Hebrews says, you look at Jesus, everything is subject to him. And so, shh, don't, no, hallelujah is great, but shh, don't tell the emperor unless you're quite ready 
because he thinks everything is subjection to him, in subjection to him. And it's not true. Don't tell the culture, because they have a Roman Empire that will last 4,000 years and more. And no, what is to come is in subjection to Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. You can look at the words carefully. I like to look up the Greek words that are, that are going on there. You know when it says everything? You know what it means? It means everything. Simple, it's a very simple word. It's, you know, it's like a three-letter word in Greek, which means all of it. And so all these things, Hebrews makes this incredible claim that all these things are in subjection to Jesus. All these things are put under him. And then it goes on, and, and you're reading in Hebrews, and you're saying, wow, he's quoting a psalm and going on about angels, but it's in Psalm 8. And he brings up a fascinating, just a phenomenal idea in, in, in Psalm 8, which you have made, taken man and put everything in subjection under his feet. It is remembering the promise and the intention of God in Genesis 1. You remember Genesis 1. You've been through there. God made the, the light to come and the dry land to appear and day and night and stars and moon and finally fashions human beings and says they are made in our image and he says have dominion over the plants, over the animals, over the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea. All things are to be in subjection to mankind. The, the Hebrews brings that back up. It says this is that kind of order. This is that kind of authority that Jesus has. goes all the way back to Genesis 1. And everybody had supposed that this, this was an idea that was long, because if there ever was a, a, you know, a slam dunk, seemed to be continual, victory of Satan is this business of us having dominion over anything. Because why, by the time Satan had finished with mankind, we could not handle anything correctly. Do, don't you agree? You can put us in families to show us how to raise children and how to love one another when we have all these common interests and we'll still end up screaming at each other. You can put us in communities where we can uphold and support and solve so many problems and, and pave a way for the, for the weak to have, have better times and for the vulnerable to be protected and we will not agree, even in as small as a community as you can get. You can give us a world with beautiful resources, with a seemingly a boundless expanse of, of means to make life better, and we will have bitter wars, and we will fight, and blood will be shed. If anything has been proven by the history of mankind is that Satan has succeeded to make us incapable of managing or handling one single thing right. And so... You would suppose that would be one dream of God's that would be set aside, but God does not give up on stuff. Do you know, the addict knows that. The person that must admit, I have an addiction. I have an addiction to, I have a struggle with. I, this is Because you can have a terrible evening. You can fail in so many ways, or even worse, know that you would have failed if you had just had a chance. And you can go to bed feeling like the worst mess that ever was and do realize you will wake up in the next morning and there's God poking you in the ribs saying, come on, another day to live for me, a fresh slate. I have you as one of my children and living for me with a transformed life that is entirely sourced by me. Let's get going. You would think after you had failed so many times or so miserably and so shamefully that God would say, I'm, forget that. But no, parents know that. Again, I t you put us in families and we have these people to love and all sorts of wonderful things to do that are just a joy to accomplish. And we can fail. We can be ashamed of how well, how we have performed. And we can go to bed feeling like that, and God will wake you up in the morning and say, guess who you are? You're a mom. You're a dad. People to love, they're that way. 
God does not give up on stuff. And God did not give up on his creation being under the dominion of a man. He called his own son to take that very place. It says that everything is in subjection to him. Now do understand, subjection, that is a word you can look up in the Greek New Testament. It means organized under. It was exactly the description of what an army unit does when its commander says, okay, let's go. They get organized under that. They have a common purpose. They uphold one another. They are listening to the direction, but there is a, a movement of wills toward accomplishing that goal. It is organized under. It is different than just saying Jesus has great power. He has power plus authority. It is always good to remember that God combines power and authority. There is a difference than power from power and authority. If you go to one of the gift shop, shops in Sugar Creek and you have a bear in the back of your truck and you take the bear out of the truck, put him in the gift shop, what will he do? Oh, he will smash all the, all the china. He will trample on the nice little quilts and things. He will break into the jars of honey and eat them with his tongue. He will make a complete mess. And then you could say to that bear with all truth, you have great power here, but you have no authority. Power to do whatever you want, but no authority to make this place what it is supposed to be. Subjection under God is God's power and authority are both operating. It is different than just being obeyed. Because putting everything in subjection to God, to saying all this is under his leadership and his authority, is pretty, sounds to us. It sounds to me like if he is crowned king, then everybody, everybody just obeys him. Everybody does what he wants. That's not quite how we should look at it. You know, as Americans, having fought one very, uh, very, very costly war at the beginning of our nation to get straight that we don't have a king, we will usually struggle at this point because we will say to us, well, somebody, it, but, and we have no experience of this. Um, it is not if everything is subjection to, to Christ, because it says here, we do not at this moment see everything in subjection to him. It would have been well clear and known to people of the day, having met kings. It does, if you're a king, it doesn't mean everybody obeys you. Because if somebody disobeys the king, does that make the person not a king? No, it makes the person who disobeys a rebel. Once there is a king, we are all either servants and subjects, free subjects of that king, or we are rebels. The king is who things are subject to. The organizer, the one who has, this is the vision for this life. This is what makes creation into, and human life, into what the vision of God the Father is, is, is all about. And people can turn away from it. People can be in outright rebellion to it. And we, and we understand that, yes, we understand authority is not always obeyed. We, we know that you could put a human king that could be ill-informed and make bad decisions, could be selfish and make bad decisions, could be influenced by other people. All that is true, so very rightly, we try to restrict the powers and separate the powers that rule over us. But we are not asked to find one who is incredibly smart to lead, we're not find, asked to one, find one who has great gifts and administrative abilities to lead. We are given one who is perfect, and he is crowned before us. We see him crowned, is what the letter to Hebrews says. He is the perfect man who is now taking his place, as Genesis 1 said, with dominion over everything. And he is made perfect 
through suffering. One last thing to maybe adjust your thinking on. Suffering, not exactly the same thing as pain. And that's good. I don't, I don't, I, my children have lived with me when I had a raging toothache, and I don't know they would say dad was perfected when he had a bad toothache. Maybe not. Grouchy, I believe. So, but anyway, they said he is made perfect through suffering because suffering will lead to pain, but the suffering itself is just the opposite of doing your own will. Remember the line in the King James, with, you had the children in here, and Jesus says, let the children come unto me. The disciples were chasing them away, right? But in the King James it says, suffer the little children to come to me. We always scratched our head. That's one, one, one word we, we translate into more modern English because, no, I'm not suffering if you bring children. I love children, you know? No, he says, but it's exactly that sense. You don't want the children here. I want the children to come. Suffer them to come. In other words, don't do what you will, but the Lord says, do what I will. He is made perfect through suffering because as he approaches the cross and his crown of thorns, he is going to tell his father, not my will, but thine be done. As he lives out those words in the Lord prayer, Lord's Prayer, thy will be done, thy kingdom come. He is made perfect because he has demonstrated what it is for a human life to be entirely surrendered to the will of the Father, that he will, he will be crowned king because he is entirely in line with God the Father as none have been since the creation of the world. He is that one who can stand with everything in subjection to him. And so, I'm reading this, and I come to an insight. I have, I have one of those moments where I say, I have a king. I'm not sure I ever looked at it that way, that I have a king. Boy, a resident of the state of Ohio in the United States of America has a king. And this king has been crowned. He has been crowned by the praises of his people and he has been perfected by the crown of suffering that he has, he has given himself entirely over to the Father. God has made him king. The Bible says we see him crowned, means he is king. And he has tasted death for me. Seemed like that's why he became king, to taste death for me. You know that the king would do anything for me. That's where we get into the wonder and the love and the grace of God, that he came to bless and to give and to forgive and to give us new life. You know what it would be like if the boss, instead of having you did the work, did the work her or himself. Happens sometimes. I know, I know my daughter-in-law, works at a Joanne Fabrics, and there's this display, you know, to do here, this needs redone, and you might tell somebody to do it, but if later in the night she might say, oh, I'll just do that myself. Change that display, get that done, and when the, they meet the next day, say, that's okay, I did it. You know what it is if the boss does it? It's done. If, the, if Jesus the king tastes death for me, it is done. I don't think we grasp that. Imagine that you are at your job. And you have ever so much work laid out upon your desk. Many things to do. This stuff really needs doing. And you go home to have your sandwich and get a good night's sleep to get started on it. And you come in in the next morning and it's all done. And your boss is standing there and said, I did that. Well, it would be a flat-out miracle. You're just never, do not hold your breath to see that happen. Bosses are, have employees so as to delegate that work to you. But if this were done, if this was a parable of the kingdom, Jesus tastes death for you. And when he has died for you, your death is accomplished. It is done. 
There will be a time when you will give up this life. There will be a time when your life will be surrendered and the Spirit goes back to the Father who gave it. There will be a time when your life might be taken from you unwillingly, but that is only so you may also know the grace and love of resurrection because your death is accomplished in Christ. He has done it. And if you ask yourself, what sort of boss would do that? Well, what sort of God would do that? If you'd say, a boss like that doesn't need, even need his employees, well, bingo. God does not need me. All the things that God has done in my life are certainly not because he needed me. You know, he is the one who has, who has, who has tasted death for me. I did not get that going. I didn't have a plan to, to see, that, see that accomplished. It's, been, it's just simply been done. I have a king. I have been made subject to him. So he therefore has said, my life is part of his plan. And he did it before I even had the notion to give him my life to use as he would. It is his doing and his doing alone. He is perfect. And therefore, his Holy Spirit is sent, and I am sanctified. He is not ashamed to call me his brother, and therefore, I am his brother. I have a king. You have a king. We have seen him crowned with the praises of the people. It is recorded in scripture that this happened and we have seen him crowned with the obedience of suffering that was the crown of thorns. He is our king, and all things are in subjection to him. And you have a choice. Every person is a willing servant of this king or is a rebel or is in rebellion to it. Every one of us is on one side or the other. If your heart is serving God, do remember you're also going to be saying, I can have a path to a perfection, to a walk with God that I never knew, and it is called suffering. It is called saying, I will look at what God's will is, and if it is not what I want to do, I do God's will. And it doesn't mean, oh good, me and God will clean up some things and get things going. No, for Jesus, it meant victory sitting at the right hand of the Father through his suffering, perfection of who, his, who he, was, he was brought into, into the world to be through this suffering. So it's twofold. My friends, are, are, you, are you one of the servants or one of the rebels? I don't know. There, there is no other way to say it, but we are all sinners and fall short of the glory of God. We are, we are all under the sentence of death, and Jesus makes this offer. He says, well, guess, guess what? I am king. You can serve me, you can, or you can stay in rebellion to me. It is absolutely your choice. But for my servants, I have tasted death for them. For all of us, if our hearts are right with God, understand he is saying, I'm going to continually show, me my, show you my will, and you'll see if it doesn't line up with yours, you know, you know what you need to do to find the heart of Christ working in your life. It needs to be God's will and not yours. Let's pray together. Father, we, we ask that, that today we, we be especially set aside to love you, to serve you. But my friends, for, for you listening, with our heads bowed, our eyes closed, if you want to want to tell God, okay, finally, finally, I will serve you. You, Lord, you know all about my sin. You know all about where I've wandered and what I've done. And, but, but today I turn. And knowing that your promise is firm, that your, your death on the cross is that payment to, for sin, that your door is wide open for me to come, I come running. I'll put my hand up to say, Lord, to me, it's, it's me coming today to be your servant. I hear you will call me a brother or a sister. Lord, may that grace be mine. And for all, also, as you're listening, is, is there that place you're, you're letting his, his will go undone? His purposes go unaccomplished in your life. And it's your time to suffer, to say, in a true sense, not my will, but thine be done. Raise your hand to say so. Come, come to the altar to pray. Seek him. 
as the praise team sings. In Jesus' name, amen.